D and D number one, a healing in Jesus name, chapter 14. Eric moved absently around the studio, straightening up, doing a few reps on the weight machines, checking his email. Unable to fall back asleep after he was awakened by one of his nightmarish dreams, he'd come in a full hour early. The dream had been disturbing, to say the least. He thought those dreams were over. He hadn't had one since he'd found Shelley. The disaster had already happened when he'd met her. He figured he was here to pick up the pieces. Last night's dream made him reconsider the possibilities. Was she safe? When Shelley wasn't locked up safely in her home, she was with him. Nevertheless, when she came in today, he'd sit her down and have a talk about safety and being aware of her surroundings at all times. New scene. Shelley was running late, again. Madly pulling on sweats and frantically dashing down the stairs, there was no way she could have been prepared for what happened next. She grabbed her keys, jerked open the front door, and never even had a chance to scream before the steely gloved hand covered her mouth. Another hand closed around her throat, strangling her as he lifted her backward into the house. He was large, so large her toes barely reached the floor as she struggled in her panic. With a flick of his wrist, he tossed her onto the sofa. Stay there, he commanded in a gruff voice. He turned his attention to speak to another man, and immediately she shot for the door, her heart pounding in terror. She got the door open and almost made it through before he grabbed her by the hair, dragged her backward, and threw her onto the floor in front of the sofa. Before she could right herself, he rolled her over, face down, roughly pulling her arms behind her. She cried out in pain, thinking her arms would snap at any moment. Shut up, he barked, his tone a deadly warning. She heard a ripping sound and realized he was taping her hands together with duct tape. Fear numbed her brain, paralyzing her. She couldn't think. This can't be happening. Not again. Not right here in her own home. Don't freeze up, she told herself. Please, don't freeze up. Do something. Fight. Yell. Do something. Somebody help me, she screamed, but found she could barely make a sound with her face smashed into the carpet. Realizing that screaming wasn't going to help her, she focused her energy, and when the man turned her over, she aimed a kick at his face. Laughing, he easily grabbed her legs and taped her ankles, stood glaring at her for a moment, and then turned and walked away. He barked orders to someone. Destroy everything that belongs to her, but don't touch the kids' stuff. Kids shouldn't have to pay for their parents' sins. Parents' sins? What is he talking about? What sins have I committed? Is he talking about my relationship with Eric? Is this some wacko religious guy here to give me a moral lesson? We haven't done anything. The sound of glass breaking and cloth ripping stopped her speculations. It dawned on her that he'd left the room, and she rolled over onto her knees and inched her way toward the door. Please, just let me make it out the door where I can scream for help, she thought. The neighbors will hear me. Will hear me. It was hard work. Again, she opened the door and started across the threshold, only to have him step in front of her. She opened her mouth to scream. The big man covered her mouth and slung her up into his arms. I am toying with you, Shelley, he whispered in her ear. I am not going to let you through this door. I am, however, having a great deal of fun watching you get your hopes up so I can dash them. No, Shelley, there is no escaping what I have planned for you today. Back in the living room, he tossed her onto the floor again, this time grazing her head on the side of an end table. Searing pain shot through her, and time slowed. She moaned as he rolled her over onto her back, painfully pinning her taped arms underneath her. She looked up at him, genuinely bewildered, and finally found her voice. Why? she cried. Why are you doing this? To show you that I can, he answered, or... To show someone that I can. She shook her head slowly. I don't understand. Not very bright, are you? A burst of laughter caused her to peer around, and two other men stood watching. The leader blocked her view when he knelt down over her. Not very bright, but definitely a looker, he muttered. He touched her with a large gloved hand, and Shelley fought down the wave of nausea and sheer panic that enveloped her. If, if it's money you want, I don't have any. 
The man's eyes narrowed, seemingly furious. He backhanded her across the face, her head turning violently with the blow. I don't need your money, he raged at her. Shelley turned her head back to face him, her eyes now wide with fear and dread as blood ran from her nose and mouth. Even the teenager who'd hit her that day on the beach in Daytona hadn't used such force. Only in movies had she ever seen anyone hit in the face. She never imagined it could hurt so much. She needed to get a grip. Pain is no big deal, she told herself. So what? He slapped me in the face. So what? She tried to keep her voice from shaking. If, if you don't want money, then why are you doing this? His eyes bore into hers. An eye for an eye. Her mind searched frantically for a time she'd wronged someone. Nothing. She'd done nothing to deserve this, yet he did know her name. Had she inadvertently done something horrible to him? What did I do to you? Not you. Your slant-eyed lover boy. Slowly, as if contemplating her beauty, he ran a gloved finger down her cheek. Tell me, what do you see in him? She didn't answer, actually couldn't answer, because his hand closed over her nose and mouth. Eyes wide, she bucked, struggling to breathe. He held her there until her world began to close in around her, and then suddenly he let go, smiling at her as she gasped for breath. I am sick and tired of hearing about Kino's greatness. He's a freaking chink, and I want him ruined. I want him to hurt, and I want you to be the one to do it. His voice was so full of intense hatred it caused large tears to well up in Shelley's eyes, but she choked them back. She wouldn't cry. Eric would tell her to use her brain, to think. She must think. Calming, she bravely looked up at the large man kneeling over her, his cold blue eyes glaring with hatred. She regarded the others. Eyes were all she could see. Each wore a mask and gloves, each dressed completely in black. Drawing a shaky breath, she closed her own eyes so she could focus and command her mind to function. They probably don't want to kill me, she thought, or they would have by now. The thought comforted her for only a moment because the very next moment her mind said, not necessarily. No, she mustn't think that way. She had to assume, assume they didn't intend to kill her, and no one would go to this much trouble to rape a woman, would they? He said he wanted Eric hurt, and he wanted her to do it, which is insane. She'd never hurt Eric. Does he think a little rough treatment is going to intimidate her into doing harm to Eric? She can't be so easily intimidated. Not anymore. Fearlessly, she looked the man straight in the eyes. There's no way I'd ever hurt Eric, she hissed at him. He had no verbal response. He simply drew back his fist and punched her square in the mouth. Wincing in pain, she tasted blood as she tried to get her bearings. You are hurting him for me, he argued calmly. Your existence is all that's needed. Her anger flared. How does my existence hurt Eric? You don't make any sense. Just do what you came here to do and get out. If Eric catches you here, he'll kill you. There was a murmuring around her, and the man rose and walked away, then turned and regarded the brave woman who would look death in the face and tempt it. Ah, sweet Shelley, you're much braver than I anticipated, but let me just say you should pray that Eric doesn't show, because then I'd have to kill him. Shelley laughed out loud at him. You won't find this so funny. He came to her and drew her taped ankles up toward her body and pushed her knees apart, forming a diamond. A little flexibility test, he chuckled. He placed his knees on her inner thighs, resting all his weight on her, digging his knees into her mu muscles. Shelley moaned with the agony. Now, why was it you were laughing, he asked sarcastically. She glared at him through her pain. Because your hatred gets in the way of your thinking. You and, grunting in pain as he again ground his knees into her thighs, she struggled to finish her statement. You and your little friends are cowards. Why else would it take all of you to attack one more woman? If Eric showed up, you'd run scared. She raised her chin defiantly as another blow struck her across her face. She wondered if he hit the same spot each time on purpose. Dizzy, her head and face throbbing, her stomach roiling, she wondered how much more she could take. He dug his knees harder into her sore thighs before he spoke again. I'll tell you what. 
If you drop out of the mart, I'll let you live. Puzzled, she looked up into his face. His thought patterns were indiscernible. There was no logic involved that she could see, and no way would she drop out of the mart. Go to hell, she breathed, bracing for the next blow. It didn't come. He chuckled instead. Well now, that's attractive. She gasped as he pulled out a small knife. He made a cut through the ribbing at the neck of her sweatshirt, calmly folded the knife, put it away, then grabbed her shirt and ripped it open. Shelley shrank down, wishing she could disappear into the floor. Somewhere in the background, she could hear the phone ringing. That would be Eric calling to fuss at her for being late. She sensed movement around her and opened her eyes. The two men, who hadn't spoken, moved toward the door. Could it be that Eric's call was chasing them away? She looked up into her captor's eyes. Next time, we'll take this further. For now, he said, rising up. He pulled a black marker out of his pocket and began writing on her stomach. He then ripped off a piece of duct tape and held it up. We can't have you screaming for help when we're trying to leave, now can we? He started to put the tape over her mouth when she giggled hysterically. What are you laughing at now? I was just thinking that what they say is right. You really can use duct tape for just about anything. He hit her again, bullseye, same spot. Shelley felt something warm splatter across her face. You won't laugh again, I promise. He slapped her over and over, her head being thrown back and forth with the force of each blow. Let's go, man. Car's here. The statement came from one of the men by the door. Shelley was immediately grateful to him. The man who loomed over her, seemingly intent on her destruction, regained control of himself. He pressed the tape over her mouth, grabbed her by the hair, pulled her up close to him. The next contact with his fist sent her into a fetal position. It was the parting kick to the back of the head that had Shelley slipping gratefully into oblivion. New scene. When Shelley hadn't shown up on time, Eric let it go. After all, she'd been extremely tired and emotionally drained the night before, but 7.30 was his breaking point. He called her. No answer. He forced himself not to panic. She was probably on her way. He called twice more, both phones, but she still didn't answer, and he drove to her house, the feeling in the pit of his stomach telling him he should have come straight from his apartment early this morning. Bill, Shelley's elderly next-door neighbor, was just emerging from his garage, arms full of colored lights. He walked over to shake Eric's hand. Late again, is she? the man asked with a laugh. Looks like it, Eric answered, looking nervously toward her door. Bill started chatting about Christmas or something, but Eric wasn't listening. He hurried up the walk toward Shelley's front door. Eric paused. Something wasn't right. Hold on a minute, Bill. Eric moved stealthily up to the door, turned the knob, and pushed it gently. Shelley lay face down on the floor by the sofa, the carpeting stained with her blood. He looked back out the door, his face pale. Bill, call 911. Tell them we need ambulance and police. And hurry. Bill moved as quickly as his old legs could carry him, and Eric moved inside and knelt by Shelley, his eyes scanning his surroundings as he reached his fingers down to her throat, searching for a pulse. Immensely relieved to find one, he went swiftly through the house to be sure no intruders remained. He returned to Shelley and untaped her hands before rolling her gently onto her back. Oh, my. Bill's voice sounded from the doorway. Eric blinked and gazed up at Bill. Untape her feet, he ordered, as he gently pulled the tape off her mouth. Her shirt was torn open and a message written across her belly. Too easy. Lips pressed tightly together, he ordered himself to get control. Her face was covered in blood. Eric found a cut on her cheek and another cut on the back of her head. He was grateful when only a few seconds later he heard the sirens. Shelley moaned and opened her eyes. Eric, she croaked. Yes, baby, it's me, he whispered, cradling her head. Some men broke in, and he wanted me to hurt you, and I told him no, and he wasn't very happy about that. I'm sorry, baby. I'm so sorry. He held her, rocking her in his arms. It wasn't long before police and paramedics converged on the tiny house, and while medics took care of Shelley, Bill and Eric told what little they knew to the police. Bill felt guilty that neither he nor his wife had heard anything out of the ordinary. Detectives arrived, and Eric requested their cooperation in keeping the media at bay. 
They pledged to do what they could, though not promising anything, since it was probably an impossible feat considering he was Ricky Kino's dad. Once at the hospital, Eric was allowed to see Shelly after an initial examination. Standing by the bed where she lay slipping in and out of consciousness, he kissed her forehead and allowed his emotions to vent for a few seconds, and then he let go of them, or at least he tried to. He laid his hands on her and prayed for healing. A doctor approached, smiling kindly. There are no broken bones. There is a concussion, however, and we'll need to keep her for at least a few hours for observation, though we'd rather it be overnight. There is a cut on her cheek and one on the back of her head that will require stitches. I'll take care of that in just a minute. Obviously, she's taken quite a beating and there will be some major bruising. Another concern right now is she trailed off an uneasy expression on her face. What else? Well, she does have quite a bit of bruising on her inner thighs and the police want to do a rape exam. She's refusing. She insists she wasn't raped, but she was unconscious and you never know what could have happened. The police say they need all the evidence they can gather for the case. She grimaced. It's not a fun procedure. No. Shelley's eyes were open and defiant. I wasn't raped, and I don't want anyone touching me. Sighing, the doctor shrugged at Eric. Please, Eric, Shelley begged. Please don't make me do this. Hey, I promise you, no one is going to make you do anything, but don't you want to help the police? It won't help them because I wasn't raped and you have to believe me, Eric. Please don't make me go through this. He grimaced as he thought, running his hand through his hair. Maybe, just maybe, James had been careless, though Eric doubted it. There was no way the police were going to find, be able to find who attacked her, much less link James to her in any way. The rape kit would be useless. It was James who attacked her, that much he knew, and James wasn't stupid. Eric would be asking Shelley to submit again to something he knew would yield nothing. What the doc said was true. She had been unconscious. It could have happened. Yet he doubted it. James wouldn't have bothered putting her clothes back on her if he'd raped her. Eric looked at the doctor. We'll have to honor her wishes. Next scene. Several hours later, Eric squeezed Shelley's hand. It's going to be okay. Shelley blinked slowly at the passing scenery as they drove. Who would hate you so much? Eric spoke quietly. His name is James Crane. He said, an eye for an eye, Eric. What did he mean? What did you do to him? Well, this isn't a good time to tell you a very long story. Beside the fact her question put him on the defensive, James had started it and Eric had finished it. Only it seems it wasn't finished. Eric sighed. He'd spoken to the detectives again when they'd arrived at the hospital to interview Shelley. He told them who'd attacked Shelley. He also told them there would be no proof, and they certainly wouldn't accuse a powerful businessman with close political ties, such as James, without evidence. Frustrated, Eric tried to get his need for retribution under control. He had to stay positive in order to truly help Shelley. He glanced over at her as her eyes drifted shut. He'd been able to convince the doctor that she'd be better off in his care in a private home than in a public hospital. James had really done a number on her. He'd hit her so hard it actually split open her cheek, and somehow he'd missed breaking her nose, but it looked like he'd tried. She began to shiver, and Eric reached over and turned up the heater in the car. Though she'd been released from the hospital, Eric realized she was still in shock, and he was worried about her both physically and emotionally. I'm so tired, she said wearily, her teeth chattering. I bet you are. We'll be home soon, and you can curl up in a warm bed and sleep. That sounds like heaven, except my head is pounding. Well, we'll fix you up soon, baby. Eric took her to his apartment and to his bed. Are you hungry? She shook her head, just so tired. He l he had her sip an herbal tea solution that would ease her headache, tucked her in, and held her until she slept. Her face seemed to change minute to minute, swelling and bruising, and she whimpered as she slept, making Eric feel completely helpless. He had been silently praying over her the whole time she was at the hospital. This time, he laid his hands on her, lifting his head, and in a strong voice, prayed for healing, both physically and emotionally. She immediately calmed, and when he felt certain she was sleeping soundly enough, he left her side to take care of business.
He had already made several calls, some on the way to the hospital, some while he waited for Shelley's release. He'd called his network of friends to task. He needed to check to see the progress of what he'd put into action. Taking out his cell, he went to work. With the help of his friends and his son, he would set up security for Shelley and track down James Crane. It was early evening when he sat back wearily. He'd been able to reach everyone except Ricky, who was probably on the slopes. Stretching his aching muscles, he went to the kitchen and dumped canned soup into a pot. It would have to do, but he would pick up some fresh raw foods to help her heal. While the soup heated, he ate a sandwich, and placing the bowl of soup and some wheat toast on a tray, he went to the bedroom. Shelley still slept. Looking at her, he realized he needed to start some ice therapy to bring down the swelling and inflammation. He'd do that right after he got some nutrients down her. He looked her over as she slept. He hadn't thought it was possible, but the swelling had worsened, and now one eye was completely black. The pain in his heart was staggering. How could he have underestimated his enemy so badly? He had heard nothing from James in ten years. Why now? The answer was so simple. Eric hadn't loved anyone for ten years. Until now, James had nothing to use against him. Setting the tray on the table beside the bed, he gently touched her shoulder. Shelley, sweetie, he said softly, trying not to startle her. She opened her eyes, blinking slowly, trying to remember where she was. Reality hit. She moaned softly. Come on, Shelly, sit up for me. She sat up slowly, dizzily. The muscles in her arms and shoulders were sore and she could barely lift herself. Her vision was blurred and she squinted, trying to focus. You need to eat a little, hun, he coaxed. I don't think I can, she answered through slurred speech. Let's try, he replied gently. I can't see you very well, and I'm having trouble talking. He swallowed. You can't see because your eye is swollen shut, and you can't speak because your mouth is swollen as well. It will get better, baby. Now, let's try to get some nourishment down you. He put the spoonful of broth to her mouth, but most of it dripped down her chin onto her shirt. Oops, sorry, he said, forcing a smile. He had her tilt her head back a little and tried again. This time she choked and the broth spattering. Eric put the spoon back in the bowl and wiped her off. Ready to try again, he asked cheerfully. In response, one tear ran down her cheek and she shook her head. Eric took a deep breath as she leaned forward and rested her forehead on his shoulder. He pressed her to him. Don't cry, sweetheart. Everything's going to be all right. We'll make it through this, I promise. I have an idea. He left and came back with a straw. And drawing the broth up with his mouth, he then transferred the straw to Shelly and let it drip slowly. The warm liquid felt good on her raw throat. He then dipped tiny pieces of the bread into the broth and placed them on the back of her tongue. It was a long, tedious process, but they did finally complete it. He smiled at her. If I told you I love you with every part of my being, does it help? She nodded and tried to smile. What can I do for you? She held her hand out, showing the blood caked under her fingernails. A bath? She nodded. Grimacing, he ran a bath for her and then held a robe out, turning his head to protect her modesty as she undressed. Eric helped her to the bathroom. As he entered, he was careful not to let her see her reflection in the mirror. There was just no reason to confront that now, he thought. Easing her down into the warm bubbles, he sat on the floor beside the tub, his back to her. Not wanting to get her face in stitches wet yet, they decided not to wash her hair. Instead, Eric suggested that she use a washcloth to rub out some of the dried clumps of blood. Eric glanced over his shoulder to see Shelley scrubbing at her stomach. She might be able to get the writing to fade, but he was sure it was definitely going to be there for a while. She looked so pitiful trying to wash it away that... Eric's anger came close to boiling over. He made himself remember it and pushed the rage down to save for another day. He gave her his brown silk uniform to wear and helped her back to bed. She snuggled down into the pillow. It smells like you, she said, sighing. Carefully placing a few ice packs on the worst areas, he stayed with her until she relaxed and fell asleep. And when Eric's cell phone went off, he quickly left the room. Hey, Dad. Saw you called. What's up? Ricky asked cheerfully. 
Are you alone? Bree's up in her room changing for dinner. What happened? James Crane got to Shelley. He hurt her bad, Rick. Oh, no. I'll need your help. I need to arrange some protection for Bree, and I'll be there soon. Thanks, Rick. New scene. Justin and Jason arrived pre-dawn Tuesday morning. After embracing, Eric filled the brothers in on the happenings of the past 20 hours, pausing at times to gain control of his emotions. I'm going to kill him, Jason swore. I'm going to rip his heart out. Justin placed a hand on his brother's shoulder. We're going to get him, bro, but not like that. Don't lower your vibration to match his. Come on now. Eric needs cool heads to help him. Jason nodded, and the brothers sat down and waited for Eric to continue. Eric didn't bother to let them know how much he himself wanted to carry out that same threat. He knew better, but couldn't seem to help himself. Each agreed that until James was found, Shelley should never be left alone. Finding James would be difficult, they knew, but they also knew he couldn't stay invisible forever. They would eventually find him. However, making something stick was another game. They were law-abiding citizens, Justin kept urging. Therefore, they would let the police handle it once they located the man. Eric and Jason agreed a little too quickly for Justin's comfort. Eric kept his thoughts to himself, those thoughts being that James Crane was a dead man. As the day dawned, the men went into the kitchen to prepare food. They turned when they heard Shelley in the hall. She shuffled slowly toward the kitchen. Good morning, Eric said as he kissed her forehead. Look who's come to visit. Justin stood, staring in disbelief. Most of Shelley's face was dark blue, and one eye had disappeared completely behind a swollen cheek. Her lips were so swollen it appeared her top lip touched the tip of her nose. He felt sick to think of the beating she must have taken caused so much damage. Are you hungry? Jason asked her. I tarred. Justin's hand balled into a fist as he realized she was unable to even speak. You're starved? Good, your appetite is returning, Eric said. However, Shelley didn't seem pleased. Actually, she seemed quite agitated. Ut et ak, she said. Eric had been ready for the confrontation <clears throat> for the confrontation. He'd removed the mirrors from the bathroom and bedroom. He simply didn't want her to have to deal with it now if he could help it. I'd rather not put them back. She stomped her foot. I ought to see. Trust me, sweetie, you don't want to see. Not yet, anyway. Please, just wait a few days for some of the swelling to go down, okay? She put her hands up to her face, trying to determine the extent of her injury. Eric put his arms around her. Can you not just trust me? Haven't I had your best interest at heart so far? She looked at him defiantly through one eye. Come on now. Go back into the bedroom and I'll bring you a delicious health shake, he coaxed. Defeated, she did as ordered. Eric watched her go. He should have known, he thought. He should have been there for her. Why hadn't he come straight to her the next morning after he'd had the dream? Uh, guilt won't help you, Justin said, reading his friend's thoughts. Sighing, Eric nodded and opened the refrigerator to prepare Shelley's breakfast. Anyway, Jason said cheerfully, she seems as spunky as usual. New scene. Hours later, it was a different story. The doctor said you needed to sleep more than anything so your body will have the energy to heal. She nodded. The defeat in her expression tore him up, and of course, that was exactly what James had been after. I'll stay with you if you'd like. Again, she nodded. He helped her get settled into bed. I sent Brian and his wife Meg to pick some things up for you. Okay, she said listlessly. Everything that belonged to Shelley had been destroyed. Every piece of clothing, shoes, personal items, everything. Except for the children's rooms, her home had been destroyed. Why, she'd asked. Because they knew it would hurt you, he'd answered. And if they hurt you, they hurt me. Why, she'd asked. Because they knew it would hurt you, he'd answered. And if they hurt you, they hurt me. Now she lay there twirling her matted hair in her fingers. She held out a bloodied cup from her head. I need to wash my hair, she said softly. I know, sweetie. Sleep first, and when you wake up, we'll take care of everything. 
New scene. Shelley awoke alone. Newly purchased items lay at the end of the bed, so she changed out of Eric's clothing into her own new things, then went looking for Eric. Justin and Jason sat in the living room speaking softly and looked up when she appeared. Where's Eric? she asked, meaning where, but she was unable to pronounce her W. He's not here, Justin told her. He wanted to get another look at your house, and he also went to meet with a detective. Can I do anything for you? She shrugged, looking sad. Look at my hair. I want to wash my hair. Well, little lady, Justin said cheerfully, I'll have you know I used to be a great shampoo girl in my aunt's salon when I was a teenager. How would you like a royal treatment? Her lip curled slightly, which Justin knew was the closest thing to a smile he was going to get. You go get the shampoo, conditioner, and towels, and I'll fix things up in here. Justin and Jason clearly cleared everything off the counter in the kitchen and removed dirty dishes from the sink, and when Shelly returned, they swept her up onto the counter and had her lie with her hair dropping down into the sink. Between the two brothers, she really did receive a royal treatment. Her hair was carefully washed and conditioned. Her hands and feet were massaged. She sat at the kitchen table while they meticulously combed and towel-dried each strand of hair so as not to disturb the stitches. They teased her and teased each other, using the joking around to try to get her to cheer up. And even though she talked a good game, she'd withdrawn into herself since the attack. Somehow, they needed to get her to buck up. Shelley knew they were trying to boost her, and she tried hard to respond, only... Once they were finished with their ministrations, a cloud of anxiety washed over her. She needed Eric. Are you hungry? She shook her head. There's nothing we can get you? No. Would you like us to stop pestering you and leave you alone? She nodded. Okay. We'll be right here in the living room if you need anything. Okay. She reached out to stop them. When is Eric coming home? Justin smiled at her. I shouldn't be too much longer. She wanted Eric. She needed him. Without him, she felt afraid and alone. And peering around the messy kitchen, she decided staying busy would probably help. She began to straighten up, but as she rinsed the plate, she saw cold blue eyes staring back at her. Her hands began to shake. When she closed her eyes a moment to get control, big black letters floated in front of her face. Too easy. Backing away from the sink, she took a calming breath, but when she loaded cups into the dishwasher, flashes of large, gloved hands came at her. Forcing herself to concentrate on her task, she finished loading the dishwasher and switched it on. But it sounded like people laughing at her and glass breaking and duct tape being torn. She put her hands over her ears. Stop it, she told herself. Clear your mind. Breathing deeply for a few moments, she got control. Feeling better, she went about putting things away. And picking up a jar of preserves, she opened the refrigerator, and there he stood, all in black, glaring at her. His hand reached for her throat, and she screamed, No! she cried, and threw the jar at him. There was a loud crashing sound, and Shelley fell to the floor and tried to crawl away, but he was coming after her so fast. He grabbed her around the waist, and she turned over on her back and kicked with all her might. And this time she connected and he rolled away, moaning. Before she had time to rise and run, someone else grabbed her from behind. Strong, thick arms wrapped around her, pinning her arms to her sides. She screamed and kicked his shins, but he wouldn't let go. She was tiring. She was weak. Someone was talking to her. Shelly, it's okay. It's me. It's Justin. Come on now. Calm down. Justin, she cried. Yes, it's me. Justin, he's here, she said, the fear in her voice very real. No, Shelley, you were imagining it. No one is here. Yes, he is. I know. I kicked him, and, and he let me go. No, Shelley, you kicked Jason. Jason? Yes, Jason, Jason said, holding his nose, and you did a good job of it. She looked over at him. There was blood all over his shirt, and horror filled her eyes. I'm losing it. I'm going crazy. Justin held her. No, you're not. You had an anxiety attack. It can happen, especially after what you've just been through. She looked down at her hands. They were bleeding, where she'd slid them across the floor over broken glass. She held her hands up for Justin to see as she sunk down to the floor. 
I'm sorry, she cried. He knelt in the mess on the floor, holding and rocking her, when he looked up to see Eric walk into the kitchen, laden with bundles. And that is the end of chapter 14.